Please be seated. So two lines from today's gospel have been known to move me to tears. So let me apologize right up front should these words do so again. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. Why these words move me so deeply is owed to one particularly formative experience they bring to mind. A little over 13 years ago, I awoke one Sunday morning full of grace. Which is to say, I was literally overflowing with gratitude and joy and excited by the prospect of worship. Because that day, by the grace of God, marked seven months of sobriety for me. But as it turned out, my younger son wasn't feeling well, so it seemed that church was off the table. Yet my wife, Teresa, knowing full well why I needed to worship that morning, then made a suggestion which had never even crossed my own mind. She simply told me to go to church on my own. A rather terrifying prospect. Yet the spirit that morning was relentless. And I remained so grateful for the last seven months of freedom. So in awe of having been released from the deadly clutches of alcohol that her strange and absolutely scary suggestion just made perfect sense. I knew in my very being that I was called to give thanks to God and I knew church was the very best place to do so. So arriving at the Methodist church, which was quickly becoming like a second home to our family, I stepped right into what had become our regular Sunday morning routine. That is, until we came to the Methodist equivalent of the prayers of the people. At which point the pastor asked, as he often did, if anyone in the congregation had anything they wanted to pray for or any answered prayers they needed to give thanks for. Now I knew in my heart that for the last seven months I had been nothing short of a walking answered prayer. Not only had my release from the torment of unclean spirits been an answer to my own prayers, it became clear in those seven months that my sobriety was also God's answer to the prayers of a good many others. Prayers that had been ascending from loved ones on my behalf for years before I could even consider offering up my own. Still, I had no intention whatsoever of being so vulnerable as to share something so private and raw, especially in God's holy house of worship. Nevertheless, in an instant, before I even knew what was happening, the same spirit which had called me to church that day by all but demanding that I express those feelings in the form of corporate worship, raised me to my feet and suddenly burst out at the top of my voice for everyone to hear. By the grace of God, I have seven months of sobriety today. Thanks be to God. And as quickly as I had been raised up, my legs gave way, as if they'd been kicked out from under me. And I crumpled into a pile on the hard wood 
of our pew. I was absolutely mortified. I was so embarrassed that had it been possible, I would have slithered under our pew and out the back doors. After managing to get myself basically upright in the pew again, I glanced up and was greeted by the face of someone who surprisingly looked even more embarrassed and horrified than I felt. You see, there was a certain choir member named Rick, whom I had come to know particularly well over the past few months. And Rick was not only my brother in Christ, he was also my brother in another sense, as he was a member of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And seeing his gentle face had become an important, if not essential, part of a particular Tuesday night meeting that I, for one, didn't dare miss. Except now, the face of my friend almost perfectly matched his gray choir robe. And I'm betting that if he could have opened his eyes any further, they would have simply rolled out of his head. As those terrified eyes met mine, his head gave a little shake instantly conveying to me his one simple request. For the love of God, please don't out me. Something I would never do, but nonetheless a terrifying prospect which must have seemed all too real to him in that confusing moment as he witnessed me gutting my own precious anonymity before God and his people. And I don't think his frightened gaze left me for the rest of the service. When worship finally ended, I quickly headed toward the door to make my long-awaited escape. But as I tried to make a break for it, I found myself beset by members of the congregation, presumably to collectively escort me off the grounds for my outburst. I'd never felt so naked and vulnerable as they literally surrounded me. So I was positively shocked when all they wanted was to thank me for sharing or congratulate me for my <coughs> sobriety or give me the proverbial pat on the back for my bravery. It seemed like everyone in the church came over for a word before I was able to squeeze my way out of their truly loving but less than welcome spotlight. Everyone that is with one conspicuous exception. The only one who intrinsically knew the gift that I had received. The one with whom I had once shared the weighty chains of addiction which had shackled both of us to our next drink. The one who must have truly understood my experience of being set free, who knew what it was to be drawn out of sheer insanity into our right minds. My fellow alcoholic, to whom I felt I owed a slightly more significant apology than the one I had hastily prepared and yet failed to deliver to that oddly joyful mob was nowhere to be found. I could only assume, fearing guilt by association, Rick had managed the very escape which had utterly eluded me. <laughs> but knowing that I'd have an opportunity to smooth things out with him that Tuesday, I felt free to finally make my way home where I hoped to apologize to Teresa for all that she had missed and to try to explain an embarrassing display for which I myself had no real explanation. As a couple of days passed, I began to think less and less about my outburst, 
Then the Tuesday night meeting came, but Rick did not. The following Sunday, I scared up some courage and we made it back to church as a family. <coughs> Rick was there, and so from across the church, we exchanged our usual nod and awkward smile, but nothing more. And I figured, enough said. That Tuesday, Rick was back at the meeting, and it seemed like things were moving towards status quo until the meeting was over when Rick suddenly made a beeline for me at a near sprint. Not the kind of maneuver I would expect from someone I'd come to know as an incredibly shy introvert. And his all but lunge was made not with fearful eyes, but with those clearly trying to blink back the tears as he posed this horrifying question to me. Do you know what you did? Well, I did and I didn't. And I'm not sure which of those I indicated by the movement of my head, but he continued regardless. Bill, who sits next to me in choir, is my best friend. We've been best friends for, I don't know, 50 years. And we've sat next to each other in that choir for 20 of those years. He paused long enough to swallow the lump in his throat and to give me just enough time to begin imagining a few of the possible catastrophic outcomes to which my announcement may have contributed before he <coughs> continued. Andy, I have been sober for two years and no one outside of AA other than my wife knows. Hell, most of my family and friends don't even know I'm a drunk. Observing another slight pause before he could proceed. Two Sundays ago, my wife and I had brunch with Bill and his wife, just like we do every Sunday. But that day was different. Because that day I finally told my best friend that I'm a recovering alcoholic. No longer trying to hold them back, the tears now rolled down his cheeks as free as could be. And as I watched my brother simply let go, I couldn't help but smile. His next words, however, came like a slap across my face. You did that. Disregarding my visible confusion and stunned countenance, he pressed on excitedly, you're sharing. Your willingness to tell everyone what God has done for you meant I could do the same. And so now we were both crying as we reached in and shared a genuine, if uncomfortable, embrace. He gave my shoulders a little shake, looked me in the eyes and whispered, thank you. I was moved, to say the least, but also quite confused. I hadn't done anything. It wasn't I who'd set him free from the bondage of alcohol. I didn't have the power to cast out his demons any more than I did to cast out my own, and I knew this because I'd been trying to cast out mine for years. Not to mention the fact that when he first got sober two years earlier, I can guarantee you I wasn't anywhere near an AA meeting on Tuesday nights. I was almost certainly climbing into a bottle, as I did almost every night. 
So what did any of this have to do with me and my embarrassing outburst? I was happy for Rick, but certainly not responsible for his sobriety or for his revelation to his friend. I couldn't even take credit for my own revelation on that fateful Sunday morning. But then that same relentless spirit, which had all but driven me to church, only to force me out of my pew in the blink of an eye like one possessed, began to slowly but surely make something completely clear to me. While Rick had been set free from his addiction two years earlier, he had spent those last two years bound up within himself. Even in the midst of his sobriety, he remained tethered to the shame of his disease. Still tormented by demons that refused to allow him even the least participation in any kind of real community. unclean spirits that kept him chained up along the margins of life, out where only the dead or cursed are meant to reside. Not a home, but a tomb is where my brother had spent his last two years without even the mean comforts that can be purchased with a drink. An essential piece was missing for him. What he still needed was the witness of another. The witness of one who had been truly set free. Not just free from alcohol, but free from the ism. Free from the shame. Free to serve God with everything God had given him and moved by that same God to unapologetically proclaim that freedom. My friend's chains had been loosed by God the same as my own, but he still desperately needed someone to tell him he no longer had to carry them. he could drop them right where he was and just walk away. Rick needed me to declare all that God had done for me before he could fully accept all that God had done for him. Then, and only then, seemingly, was he free to do the same. In that moment of clarity, I made a vow that by God's grace, no matter my fear, regardless of the consequences and the cost be damned, I would never withhold my witness from anyone who needed to know what God is doing for me in order to see what God is doing for them. One little vow as a Methodist layman, which as you can see, has led to a great many others. A vow that has been essential over the past dozen years as God took an otherwise hopeless alcoholic, continually seized with the desperate fear of others seeing who and what he really was, utterly possessed of nothing more than the constant thought of just one more drink, and slowly shaped him into nothing less than this servant of God, 
who is now utterly free to honestly say, here I am. What you see and hear is what you get. A promise that has forced me to hear more truly God's daily call upon my life. And one which has brought me a thousand miles from my home to this moment. Where I am now free to perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. Therefore, I will not keep silent. And I will not keep to myself what I have been so freely and graciously given. But will do my best to repay to his people all that God has done for me. I will go wherever he sends me. I will speak the truth of salvation in Jesus Christ alone to whomever he gives me. I will declare his name to my brethren and in the midst of the congregation I will praise him until he receives my final breath. All the while praying that you will do the same. And for that, I dare not apologize. Not now. Not ever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.